First of all, you have in front of you a depressed elderly man. However, with a smiling face. This is because I have worked for sustainable development for 40 years, and it is obviously in vain. Uh, the world is less sustainable now than when I started this hard work 40 years ago. And this has started to influence me. The second uh, uh, point I want to make is that this failure doesn't really uh, tell us that we should stop working for uh, the cause of sustainability. We have to keep fighting, and I guess the only difference is that we ought to learn from all we have done wrong over the last 40 years, so that the next 40 years can become uh, somewhat better. 40 years ago, uh, my friends and I wrote uh, The Limits to Growth. This small book that appeared in 1972 contains 12 different pictures of the future from scenarios from 1970 to the year 2100. Six of these uh, scenarios were kind of sad scenarios, where something went wrong in the 21st century, resources ran out or pollution exploded. Six of the scenarios were kind of positive scenarios, where certain degrees of sustainability was actually achieved during the century with uh, higher quality of life. The important thing about the Limits to Growth book was that at the time in 1972, we did not know enough to be able to tell which of those 12 futures was the most likely one. We recommended, of course, that one should pursue uh, the attractive, the positive scenarios, uh, but we could not tell which one was most uh, likely. And as a consequence, the Limits to Growth only contained very general conclusions, like the type that the planet is small, we cannot grow for another 100 years without difficulty, that overshoot is likely, namely that our pet institutions of democracy and capitalism would certainly allow the global system to expand beyond the sustainable carrying capacity of the globe. And then finally, we made a simple statement that once you have allowed world population and economy to grow into an unsustainable situation, there is only one way out, namely down, either through planned uh, decline or uh, through a collapse in the market or, or, or by nature. So the important point 40 years later, is that today we know very much more. Uh, we do know uh, that, first of all, growth has actually continued for another 40 years. The population has been expanding. The physical aspects of the economy has expanded. Uh, the second thing is that it is now proven that our hypothesis at the time, our warning at the time, that uh, capitalism and democracy would allow uh, uh, the system to expand beyond its uh, carrying capacity has actually transpired. And the simplest way to show that we are in overshoot is, of course, to think about climate gas emissions. Uh, currently, we are emitting into the atmosphere every year roughly twice as much CO2 as is being absorbed in the world's oceans and in the world forests. The difference is accumulating in the atmosphere, and as the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere goes higher and higher and higher and higher, the temperature will, of course, also get higher and higher and higher. And this will not stop until we stop putting uh, the excess CO2 into the atmosphere. We are in overshoot. And then the third uh, observation from the last 40 years is that resources have not run out, at least not yet. We also know so much, I think, at this point in time, that it is now possible to move one step ahead from the scenario analysis to actually making a forecast, to tell what will actually happen in the future. I have had to shorten the time horizon from 130 years to 40, but over the next 40 years, I think the momentum in the system is so heavy that it is very unlikely that we are going to deviate from what I forecast as the likely future over the next 40 years. Uh, and clearly, if there was some truly extraordinary action, you know, over the next 40 years, then, you know, we might be able to deviate from uh, the, the narrow path, but I don't think so. 
My forecast is described in a book that appeared last year as a report to the Club of Rome commemorating the 40 year anniversary of the first book, The Limits of Road Book. Uh, it has appeared now in a number of, of languages. The interesting thing is the website, the book website, www.2052.info, where the tens of thousands of numbers and equations and spreadsheets and the whole schmear is available if you're interested. And they, it's open access and you can just go in and it doesn't cost anything and you can create your own uh, future if you want to. Of course, my is much better than yours. But, uh, but there you can make yours if you want to. What I do in order to make the global forecast is that I split the world uh, in five regions. I make a forecast for each of the reason, regions, sum up the forecast, and that's the global forecast. The, re uh, the regions that I use is, first of all, the United States of America, secondly, China, Thirdly, the rest of the industrial world, so it's the OECD countries less the United States. Uh, then Bryce are the 14 biggest emerging economies. So it's the BRICS, you know, it's Brazil, Russia, India. Uh, China has, of course, its own category. And then the E is for the 10 emerging economies with more than 100 million people. So this is the Indonesias and the Nigerias and uh, etc. And then the ROW is, of course, the, the rest of the world, which are the 140 countries, which are largely small and largely poor. Uh, and as I uh, told you, uh, I do the forecast by looking at each of these, deciding what it is going to look like over the next 40 years, adding it up, and then I get my global uh, forecast. And let me go very quickly through the global forecast. Uh, because of time, it's easiest to talk about the whole world, uh, and then I'll make some comments at the end on regional differences. The simplest and starting point for the forecast is the population forecast. And in all these graphs, if you look at them, history is the 40 years to the left, and my, which is largely UN and World Bank and other traditional statistics, and to the right uh, is my forecast. The world population will peak at something like 8 billion people in 2040, and in 2050, the world population will actually be declining. This is, of course, a much lower number than the number you think you know, and this is because you're unduly influenced by the UN medium uh, forecast for population developments. The reason why I think the world population will be much smaller is because I think the fertility the total fertility will continue its spectacular fall much faster than, than uh, uh, most people think. Uh, you should be aware of the fact that the total fertility, which is the number of children per woman during her reproductive age, was at four and a half kids in, in 1970. It is now two and a half, and I forecast that it will actually go down to one uh, by 2050, and as a result, the world population will peak at eight billion uh, in 2040. Uh, why will the fertility decline so dramatically? This is, of course, because in the rich world, the women will continue to choose a job rather than more children. Uh, and in the poor world, as we urbanize, uh, we get a higher and higher fraction of the population in big slums. And although poor people are poor, you know, they're not stupid, it doesn't make sense to have a large family when you live in the slum. While it did make, of course, a lot of uh, sense to have a big family in the farm. And all of this uh, we are going to see. And as a consequence, the world population will be much smaller than most people think. <coughs> then I proceed to what interests you more, which is my forecast for the world economy. So this is the world GDP. This is the world annual production of goods and services. And uh, what has happened over the last 40 years is that the world economy has grown at 3.5% a year. This is a number that you remember, and which is also a correct number uh, in the statistics. This means that the world economy at this time is four times as big as it was in 1970. If the world were to come back to its traditional growth rate of 3.5% a year, the world economy in 2050 would be four times bigger than it is today. That's 3.5% a year for another 40 years. This 
is not going to happen, uh, is my forecast. The world economy in 2050 will be roughly only one half of this, roughly two times, 2.2 times uh, the current one. So the growth rate is going to be much lower over the next 40 years than it has been over the last 40 years. Why is this? It is largely because the rich world, Europe and the United States and Japan and Australia, will not grow at all. Uh, hard, they will grow only close to zero over this period. And why is this? This is because, first of all, uh, you should think of, of the GDP as the product of the potential labor force, namely all those people that can work, multiplied with the productivity, the output per person between 15 and 65. As the population stagnates over the next uh, 40 years, and this of course happens first in the rich world where the population is already more or less stable, uh, the potential labor force you know, starts to decline, and then comes the question, what happens to productivity? What happens to output per person per year? And in my mind, it is going to, the growth in the productivity is going to come to a halt, basically for the reason that we have already done the simple thing, which is to move people from the farm into manufacturing. Then we have added machinery capital. We have moved them onto simple office work. We have added computers and we have moved them into services and entertainment and education. And then on into health work and onwards into old care. Uh, and increasing productivity when you have a population which is largely employed in the uh, health sector and the, in the social care sector is much, much more difficult than increasing productivity when you are you know, still having a large fraction of your employment uh, in the industrial sector. And the result, when you multiply the two, you see that the world GDP will be more or less stable around the turn of the, in the middle of the century and actually be declining uh, at a later point in time. Of course, the poor countries are going to, some of them, uh, demonstrate spectacular growth as they're catching up with the West in the, in the way Japan did first, South Korea did next, and China is in the process of doing at this time. Uh, so that's the reason why we will still have, you know, economic growth at a couple of percent, you know, over the next 40 years, but it will not be at the three and a half. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very good news from the, for those of you who are worried about resource use. Because if the, the GDP in the term, middle of the century is one half of what most people think. It means also that the demand for or consumption of energy, resources, food, water, etc., will be of the order of one half of what you think it will be or most analysts think it will be. And if you plank my demand figures into most of the analysis that you have read, you will see that there isn't any shortage of energy, water, food, etc., uh, etc. Et so, the sad news that there will be a lot of more poverty because the GDP will be much smaller is of course partly balanced by the fact that there will not be any resource constraints uh, of any importance in my mind over the next 40 years. Uh, let me then move on uh, to the third uh, important thing for you to, to bring uh, from this uh, lecture. A modern society, global society, is facing already and will face increasingly over the next 40 years uh, well-known problems of depletion, pollution, climate change, climate damage, inequity, which has to be redressed, etc. Uh, the easy way, so the question is how are we going to, to do that? How much money are we going to spend on solving those problems? Uh, here is my guess at this, and I treat the money we use for solving those problems as investment. You know, it's actually the labor and capital that we will be using to repair the hurricane damage after it has occurred. You know, the general and simple view is the following. My, I'm educated in the United States. I lived there for a long time. I love the United States, but, you know, that country is never going to spend a lot of uh, money, uh, labor and capital, on reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, you know, over the next several decades, which means that the hurricanes will continue to create problems for the 
nation, which means that they will not spend money up front to solve the problem, but they will have to you know, spend the money uh, repairing the damage afterwards. So basically, uh, you know, in the investment fraction of the economy, the amount of labor and capital which is used to repairing damage or getting access to oil under the Arctic, which is what we're spending the Norwegian money on, rather than getting the cheap uh, oil from somewhere else, uh, this will basically increase the fraction of the economy, which is not consumption. And when you subtract that increasing fraction from the red line, you see global consumption actually leveling off uh, around 2040. So from that point on, we will not be increasing the total consumption of goods and services. And this will not happen because the environmental movement and other no growers actually succeed in implementing wise policy you know, of uh, limited uh, consumption in the rich world. It will happen because we are not capable of growing the economy fast enough and will be forced to spend an increasing share of the GDP on obtaining the resources to run the, the system and to repair all the damage which the unintended climate uh, change is going to produce for us. This is the energy intensity of the economy. The green line shows how spectacularly we have improved the energy efficiency of the economy over the last 40 years. I assume that we're going to continue to do so. There is no reason to believe, since it's possible in principle, that we will not continue. So the green line continues down, uh, multiply with the GDP, and you get global energy use. Global energy use will peak in 2040, and that's the time when we will use the most fuels and, and, and coal, oil and gas, the whole speed, uh, at the time, and in 2050, even the global energy use will be in decline. Uh, there is more detail in the forecast. If you dig down here, is the composition of that energy use. And you see how from 2010 onwards, you know, coal use goes up uh, for at least a couple of more decades. Gas use, of course, even more spectacularly so. It looks as if the oil uh, consumption is already at its <coughs> peak. Here you see my version of the peak oil thing. It's a long drawn peak of some 30 years, where the only thing that is happening is that a fraction of conventional oil is going down and the fraction of unconventional oil, offshore, deep offshore, bio, uh, etc., and uh, the shale oil is actually going up. But then you see at the end, most of the fossil fuels are declining you know, uh, in annual use. And this is not because they're running out. You know, the, the amount of booked reserves for oil, coal, and gas in the energy companies of the world is essentially twice as big as the amount of oil, coal, and gas which is going to be used over the next 40 years, which shows, for instance, the lunacy of the Norwegian uh, activity, you know, we're pumping 30, oh, call it 25 billion uh, euros a year into exploring for new oil and gas in the Arctic, you know, when already the booked reserves are twice what humanity is going to use over the next 40 years, which is interesting, which of course proves the fact that most people don't disagree with my forecast, but uh, that's the way it is. The reason why the, the, the coal, oil, and gas finally starts to decline is, of course, the yellow line, the renewable energy, which is the, the wind and the solar and the, uh, the hydro and the biomass, which is gradually forcing its way into the market and then finally starting to squeeze out fossils. And in 2050, uh, still there will be 60% fossil, but uh, at least 40% will be uh, on the renewable side. Once I know the energy use, I can easily calculate how much CO2 humanity is going to emit uh, over the next 40 years. Uh, you are aware of the fact that we're aiming for 50 to, to a cut of 50 to 80 percent of the emissions in 2050. <laughs> That's the you know, agreed uh, ambition level in order to keep the temperature under plus 2 degrees centigrade. Uh, you see, my forecast is that we will be uh, cutting zero. In 2050, we will be emitting exactly as much CO2 as we do at this point in time. The only difference is that now emissions are growing at 3% a year, and in 2050, it will be going down at 3% a year. So at least that's a step in the right direction. 
uh, but of course it's a step uh, much too slow. Uh, when I know what the CO2 emission will look like over the next 40 years, it is easy to calculate the temperature over the next 40 years. That's just to do what I did, to send the red curve to my friends in the United States who run the big climate models. And uh, here is the temperature that you get. So the temperature will increase from 0.8 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial times, which is the current heating, to plus 2 degrees in 2050. And plus 2 degrees, as you remember, is the danger level agreed in Durban. And we will passing through this in good style in 2050. Uh, and uh, when you then sneak view into the second half of the future, the, the century, you see that it goes up to plus 3 degrees centigrade in 2080, and then it starts to level off because the world economy at that point in time is, of course, declining, and technology is still progressing, and the shift towards the renewables are still taking place, and then the, the temperature will stay more or less the same, you know, with a half-life of 100 years or so, while the CO2 molecules, you know, gradually uh, are extracted from uh, the atmosphere. Just in order to, then you might ask the question, is this dangerous, is this sad, is it, what, what, what is this? Uh, and the answer is that uh, uh, science doesn't know. If we heat the, temp the globe to plus three degrees centigrade, it may be that the, the tundra melts. Uh, and if it melts, this is sad, because then a lot of CO2 is going to be emitted and methane. Uh, if it doesn't melt uh, the tundra, that's better because then at least we don't get self-reinforcing climate change in the second half of the century. However, the run-up to this, the next 40 years, is of course not going to be particularly pleasant because this is of course an endless sequence of extreme weather events and a hurricane here and a flood there and a drought there and you know the whole spiel and the coral reefs will be bleached and things will be very sad. But not catastrophic. Sadly, I don't see any real catastrophe on the climate front over the next 40 years, which I would have liked to see because I think that's the only thing that would force democratic society to actually do something about the problem up front rather than waiting until the problem occurs. So this is a steadily graying of, of societies. Just to be quick and, and uh, indicate to you that there are other dimensions in the study. I now picked out the population to CO2 uh, line of thinking. Here's the food uh, side of the equation. Uh, since I know how many people there will be and how rich they are, I know, of course, exactly how much food they're going to eat. Uh, and uh, so the food production, the food consumption will go up by 70% uh, from now until 2050. And the world agricultural system is more than capable to produce on a sustainable basis a 70% increase in the food. So that's not going to be a big problem. We will use some of the land reserves in Ukraine and, and the black soil belt in <coughs> Russia and some of the Brazilian spare land. And, but then largely we will be increasing the land yield, you know, using the totally standard pesticides and, and agri you know, uh, fertilizer and irrigation, plus in China a solid dose of genetically modified uh, uh, plants. I don't like that, but it's easy to see that this will be done. Uh, the important thing about this slide is point number one, that there is, of course, no physical constraint on the production of food. Uh, the reason why people starve is, of course, not because of physical limitations on food production. It is because they can't afford to buy the food. So the starvation is an income distribution issue. The reason why there will be essentially more or less as many starving people in 2050 as now is that the poor uh, guy in Africa cannot actually afford to pay for food what it takes to take an Ukrainian farmer to actually bother to till the land which is outside his uh, farm. Main conclusion, I apologize for this horrible run through of a lot of, of fact but it's the only way to start uh, uh, discussing. So when your spouse asks you tomorrow, you know, what did he say? This is what he said. He said that the world population and economy will grow more slowly towards 2052 than most people expect. 
but still fast enough, sadly, to trigger a climate crisis. And consumption will stagnate because the world society will have to spend ever more on repair and adaptation. And for those who have read The Limits to Growth, you know, this is essentially that the future will resemble scenario number two out of those 12 scenarios from 1972. At that time, we called it uh, the climate, the pollution crisis. In other words, because this is an important point, uh, what will happen over the next 40 years is that global growth will stop, or at least slow down, and it will do so by itself. It will, the population growth will stop, not because of wise policy, but because the women of the world will choose to have fewer children, both in the rich and, the, and in the poor world, and this will slow uh, population uh, growth actually to a standstill. And then uh, the economy will also grow ever slower, not because we are not trying to make the economy grow. You look around these days and you see exactly what we will be seeing over the next 40 years. But simply because we will not, the economists won't be able to make the economy uh, grow. And the irritating thing is that this slowing down will occur just so slowly that we manage to trigger uh, a climate problem in the process. So the accumulated emissions from this slowing uh, global economy will be sufficient you know, to drive us above the plus two degrees centigrade and into uncertain uh, territory. And it is important that this slowing growth, of course, has the totally obvious side effect that there will be many more poor people in 2040, both in the rich world, but particularly in the poor world, than most people think. Let me this, I've now spoken about averages, global averages, and they are uh, normally misleading. Uh, and uh, let me then try to, to go down uh, at the regional level with one of the central variables. This is the after-tax disposable income you know, per person year in fixed dollars uh, over a long period of time. And the, the top line is that of the United States of America, which is the most mature, the most productive economy on the surface of the earth, and as a consequence, with the highest average after-tax disposable income. After-tax in this content means after a person has paid his or her fair share of the increased investments that are necessary in order to you know, handle uh, the situation. Here you see uh, the income of the, of the Americans having doubled more or less over the last uh, 40 years. And again, for the, those of you who know uh, what I am talking about, you know that this is another average which is totally misleading. What has happened in the United States is that the blue collar people haven't gotten a raise since 1980, you know, so that the blue line should actually have been a horizontal line for the last 30 years. And the elite has taken, you know, my friends have taken basically uh, all the economic growth that uh, has occurred in the United States over the last 30 years. The sad news for the Americans is that this will continue you know, for another 40 years. Actually, a little more, little worse. Uh, I think that uh, the average, the, the average disposal, after tax disposable income in 2050 will be roughly 15% below what it is today. You may ask the question, why is this happening? Well, first of all, because this is the most mature economy on the surface of the earth, who have already made the whole shifts of the labor force, you know, from where it is easy to increase productivity into the tertiary and quartiary sectors. Secondly, they have a huge debt to the Chinese. And in order to re, you know, and this will, in order to repay, will require a restructuring of the American economy. Uh, so that they produce something that the Chinese are interested in. Uh, and this, uh, I don't think, uh, will happen for the, because of the third reason, namely that the Americans have a dysfunctional uh, decision system. You know, the Americans aren't even capable of making simple uh, decisions uh, relatively fast. What is required over the next 40 years is very complex societal decisions in the United States, involving huge transfers of income and wealth from the elite to the masses. This will not happen, and as a consequence, uh, that's what is going to happen to the US. The green line is us. I, I, actually, it's you, less Norway. 
So Norway is, of course, uh, Norway cannot be used for any purposes in an overview. Uh, so this is you. And, and uh, it's essentially the same as the United States, except a little better. So st stable average incomes over the next uh, 40 years instead of a decline. Why? Not so mature as the United States, so it's still possible to copy some of the solutions the Americans have done. Uh, no big debt to the Chinese, which is an advantage in this case. And then finally, um, although our decision systems or systems of governance aren't perfect, they are at least capable of making decisions every now and then. You know? So it's, we are better than the Americans on, on, on reaching some kind of actionable uh, decision. The red line is the winner. This is the, these are the Chinese. The, chi the average Chinese will be five times as rich in, in 2050 as he or she is at this point in time. And on, so the average Chinese will more or less be like the average European when we get to, to 2050. Uh, how is this possible? This is possible because of the perfect alignment of the interests of the Chinese people and the Communist Party of China. Both are dead set on getting rich as fast as possible. And since it is possible, it will happen. Yes, there are the 3% of the Chinese that would rather like to say what they think, you know, rather than getting rich as fast as possible. But my forecast is that the 97% of the Chinese who are much more interested in getting rich will control those 3%. And legitimately, legitimately so, in my mind, you know, if you think that the dictatorship of the majority is a proper rule, and of course most Democrats think so. I, I have not said that I am a Democrat, but that's... Uh, the, the, the Burgundy line is uh, the, seven, the 14 big uh, emerging economies. Uh, I have no uh, certain opinion on whether all of the 14, how they're going to do. This is the same as asking, will India make it, or will Indonesia make it, or will Brazil make it? So I've done the safe bet. I say half of them will make it, and the other half will not be able to copy you know, the, the, the rapid uh, transition uh, into a, a modern economy. And then finally, I have an opinion on the 140 poor countries. They have, over the last 40 years, managed to achieve roughly 2% a year growth which means that the average income has gone up from $1 a day in 1970 to $2 a day uh, at this point in time. I think they'll do exactly as well over the next 40 years, which means that the income will be $4 a day in 2050, which is, of course, progress, but uh, they will, of course, stay uh, poor compared to the rest uh, of the world. <coughs> it is important to make the point that this is not a rosy future. Many people look at this and say, since there are no bumps on the curves, they think that everything is fine. Uh, this is not nice for uh, rather big groups of the world population. And this is irritating to a person like I, who has been spending so much time on trying to achieve an, a sustainable world. Because, of course, I know that it is technically possible to create a very much better world. You know, all the, and it's particularly the climate crisis that could so easily be handled. Uh, all we need to do is to shift roughly 2% of the labor and capital of the world from dirty sectors to clean sectors, and that's basically what it does. So we need to, we need to move, you know, the guys that are currently making fossil f cars to making electric cars. We need to take those people that currently build coal-fired utilities and make them build windmills and, and solar panels. We need to take the persons that are digging down gas pipelines, you know, rather hang copper wire, you know, to distribute the, the electricity from the, the solar uh, uh, installations and the windmills. Uh, and so it's, it's very simple to do. Uh, the problem is, of course, that since the solutions, the clean solutions are slightly more expensive than the dirty solutions, we don't do this. Because, of course, we choose always the cheapest solution and to try to argue in favor of doing something which is more expensive than the cheapest thing normally fails. And that is the problem. So the fundamental problem, why we will create for ourselves such a sad future, is human short-termism. You know, we are not willing. 
to make a sacrifice, an extraordinary sacrifice today, in order to get an uncertain benefit for our children and grandchildren 30 to 60 years down the line. Sure, people are willing to make sacrifices with a five-year horizon. They actually pay a lot of money to go to my school in order to get the hope of a better job five years down the, year, the line. But they do not sacrifice voluntarily today for an uncertain benefit, which is much, much farther down the line. And that's the core problem uh, of the climate uh, uh, crisis, the way I see it. Some optimists say that you're wrong, the market will solve this problem. Capitalism will solve this problem. Well, my view is that that is totally wrong. Capitalism is made in order to allocate capital to the, cheap, to the most profitable project, which is the cheapest solution. And if you then try to force uh, capitalism to put money into what is not the cheapest, you don't succeed. We need to channel the money into windmills, which cost between two and three times as much as coal per kilowatt hour, or even worse, into solar, you know, which is even more expensive, or deep offshore wind or whatever. This won't happen by itself. Then other optimists say that this is easy because we just pass regulation. You know, we internalize the externalities, as it's called in economic speak. Uh, we put regulations in place which aligns the corporate interest with the societal interest. And I say, good luck. <laughs> we have spent 20 years now trying to get a carbon price in place you know, the, which would do that trick, get us off the fossil uh, line, uh, it won't be done. It hasn't been done in 40 years. I mean, all we've gotten is a puny uh, European or EU ETS that has a carbon price which is totally insignificant in the big uh, picture. Uh, and the horrible thing is that if there are uh, a politician who has the right perspective and tries to fight for some of these more expensive solutions. Of course, the voters very quickly discover that this will lead to higher gasoline prices or higher prices of electricity in the short term, and that person is out of the office within four years. So we have a wonderful system where the short-term nature of the individual is reflected in, again, the pet institutions of democracy and capitalism, keeping it onto an easily predictable set of decisions which are all in the short-term interest of the nation. And this is what I'm forecasting, that we will not dump democracy, we will not dump capitalism, and consequently it is fully possible to tell what will happen. Normally, I end my talk at this point in time, uh, and, uh, and uh, people are very unhappy. I've learned. So I need to add uh, one thing, which is uh, the issue of uh, what should be done. Normally, I don't want to tell, because it won't happen. Uh, and so you're, I've already told you what will happen. And those things that could have been done, the extraordinary action that would have solved the problem, will be rejected fiercely by democracy and capitalism by short-term human beings. And so it's actually a waste of time, in my mind, to tell you what ought to be done. I've tried this 30 or 40 times before I gave up, and now I do it the other way around. I tell you what should be done. But then please promise not to waste my time telling me that those things will not happen. I agree with you. They will not happen. So, but I, I, I will tell you, in order to make the discussion afterwards more efficient, you know, what needs to, what should happen. So what should happen are five things. First of all, we should introduce the one-child family in the rich world. We need to accelerate the decline in the population by introducing the one-child family. Secondly, we should, we should, of course, ban the use of coal, oil, and gas. Most of the CO2 comes from those things. There are technical substitutes you know, for all of them, and uh, this we should do, and we should, of course, do it in the rich world first, and we shouldn't really ask someone else, you know, the poor, to, to sacrifice more than they have sacrificed. We should start doing this, and in 20 years' time, we would have solved the problem, and then the solution can be copied by the then slightly uh, richer or less poor uh, countries. 
Thirdly, instead of doing all the well-intended development work that we are doing, we should take those few billion that we are actually uh, you know, sending uh, to the poor world and use it all to build a low carbon energy system in the third world. So that we should go and build the windmills, the hydro plant, the solar panels, the biomass treatment, you know, in order to avoid the situation where they have to choose the simplest solution, coal, and then, you know, postpone for another 30 years a reduction in the emissions from the poor world. Fourthly, and I remind you, please don't tell me afterwards that this will not happen. It will not happen. But on the, you know, in order to handle the, the short-term nature of the human being, I think the only approach would be to establish a supranational institution that actually tells the nation state how much CO2 the nation state is allowed to emit. This is uh, so a global central bank for climate gas uh, emission rights, basically. Uh, fine, and then since I'm at it, you know, uh, one should at least uh, add number five, which is basically since we know that incomes in the rich world will not grow over the next 40 years, why not we use this opportunity to change the stupid goal of, of society, which is to increase, you know, purchasing power for, for us stinking rich individuals, you know, rather go for something which is achievable and much more sustainable, namely, you know, seeking a higher well-being as a societal goal in a situation where the population is stable and where the income is stable. This is easily doable if you start thinking about it, it's just that most people have never thought about it. That's it. I have not included these extraordinary actions in my forecast for the simple reason that I don't think they will be done. <coughs> At the same time, and I should of course have included, you know, close down democracy or close down capitalism. These things will not happen either. And this is the basis for my forecast. Uh, I should end uh, repeating, of course, that I don't like what I see, although I present it with a smile in order to make you not go asleep. Uh, this is, of course, not the type of future that uh, you would have gotten if you elected me as your dictator. Uh, <laughs> but this is the future that you will get. You know, and that's, uh, uh, so the only hope I have is of course that by being sufficiently arrogant and irritating, you know, I might kick some of you into starting working on those extraordinary actions that are necessary in order to get the world off the forecast, uh, off my forecast. Thank you very much. <laughs>